Hello all, I welcome you to this session of Bioinformatics for Schoolers course. In today's lecture, we will be learning about some major file formats which we use in bioinformatics, how do they look like and what exactly do they mean. Before starting, let us quickly brush up some basics which you guys would have got familiar in many of the previous lectures. So, we know that DNA is our genetic material which carries the hereditary information from one generation and passes it on to the next generation. So this DNA is made up of some organic molecules which we call as nucleotides. There are four major nucleotides starting with A which is adenine, T, thymine, G, guanine and finally C which is cytosine. So, what are these nucleotides and how are they made up of? When we take each of these nucleotides, they are made up of three major components. The first one being the nitrogenous bases and followed by the sugar molecules. This can either be a ribose sugar molecule or a deoxyribose sugar molecule. And finally, we have the phosphate group. So a combination of these nitrogenous bases, which is attached to a sugar molecule, which is further attached to a phosphate molecule, together forms either a DNA or an RNA. So now when we look at the DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, we see that we have a deoxyribose sugar molecule, which is attached to a phosphate group and which is also attached to a nitrogenous base. In this case, it is the adenine. So similarly, we have thymine, we have guanine, and we have cytosine. This is how this is how a fundamental DNA unit looks like. Now talking about RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, it is very similar to a DNA with few differences. So in DNA, in DNA we had the deoxyribose sugar molecule, whereas in RNA we have the ribose sugar molecule. And like we saw before, it is also attached to a phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. In this example, it is an adenine. And it, another difference between a DNA and an RNA is that instead of thymine, in RNA, we have uracil and then we have guanine and cytosine. So these, this is a fundamental RNA unit. So now we know that these A, T, G and Cs together uh, they form a sequence and then they form the fundamental building blocks of our genetic material. But the question here is that how do we know or how do we find out the sequence or how do we find out the order in which these nucleotides are arranged in our DNA? Because uh, it can either be arranged as A, T, G, C and so on or it can be arranged in some other order. Like for example, it can be arranged as G, C, T, A or for that matter, any order it can be arranged. So how do we find out in which order or in which sequence these nucleotides are arranged in a DNA? So for that, we have a technique called as DNA sequencing. So in, in for the next few minutes, we are going to have a very quick overview of how this DNA sequencing technique works. So let us see that. Let us see how this DNA sequencing technique works. We know that human genome is very huge and it is made up of 3.2 billion nucleotides. That is, it is made up of 3.2 billion A, T, G and Cs. And since this human genome is huge, we usually, whenever we perform a DNA sequencing, we usually fragment it into some smaller chunks, smaller fragments of DNA, and then we sequence them in a sequencer. And once they are sequenced, we get the output. And from the output, we analyze the data. And once we analyze the data, we get to know in what order these nucleotides are arranged. So we need to look into this in a greater clarity, right? So let us go step by step. So the first step is the sample preparation step. It is the step in which we prepare our sample DNA. So what exactly happens in this step is that, like we had discussed before, we have the human genomic DNA, which is very huge. So we perform the first step, which is the fragmentation step. We, we fragment this DNA into multiple smaller chunks. And then to these fragments, we add some components which are essential for sequencing to occur. For example, adapters. We add adapters to these smaller fragments. And once all the essential components are added, 
we perform something called as amplification. Amplification necessarily mean we make multiple copies of these fragments and once we are done with amplification, our sample preparation step is done. So now we are done with our sample preparation. We have our sample ready. So once we have our sample ready, we are good, good enough to go with our sequencing step. So with every sequencer, we, uh, we have something called as a flow cell. Every sequencer has flow cell and this, in this flow cell, we are going to load our sample, which we had prepared in our previous step. And this flow cell, we are going to put inside our sequencer. So what exactly happens in a sequencing procedure is that we have our template DNA, that is the single stranded DNA, which we see here. And based on what nucleotide is present in our template DNA, the complementary uh, synthetic nucleotide gets added at that particular position. For example, here the first nucleotide is T and the complementary, nu complementary nucleotide to T is A. So what happens is A gets added to this particular position. Similarly, wherever there is a T, the synthetic A gets added. And similarly, wherever there is a A, T gets added and when wherever there is a C, the G gets added. And based on whatever synthetic nucleotide is getting added to the template DNA, a light is generated in the sequencer. And this light is specific to whichever nucleotide is getting added. For example, if it is a A, then a yellow light gets generated just for example, and for example, if we have a G, a green light gets generated. If we have a T, a blue light gets generated. And if a C is getting attached to our template DNA, a red light is getting generated. So now we are done with sequencing and we are going to store that data in form of a human readable file using some of the computational tools. And in this lecture, we are going to see how exactly these files look like and how are we going to interpret these files. So before going into that, we need to discuss why do we need to organize this data into a particular format or what exactly are these file formats and why are they important. The reason is that let us consider a, a case where we have a file and it has multiple lines of A, T, G, C alphabets which gets listed. So obviously, we get confused in how to interpret this data or what exactly does this data even mean. Whereas on the other hand, let us consider we have a file and that file gives us the data of what exactly the sequence is or the sequences from which organism and how good quality or bad quality that sequence is. In some predefined template or context, it becomes very much easier for us to interpret the data. So this is the whole point. Why do we need to organize the data which we get from a sequencing output into some specific formats? The whole reason to do this is for easier interpretation. So with this known, let us go into the very first file format which we are going to discuss for today's lecture. That is the FASTA file. A FASTA file is generally used to store sequence information and this sequence information can either be a nucleotide that is a DNA information or a protein information. So DNA information is usually stored in the form of nucleotides that is A, T, G and C whereas protein information is usually stored in terms of amino acids. Now when we look at the history, when was this FASTA file uh, developed or when was this FASTA file format initially developed, we see that the fact is there was a software called as FASTA which was developed in the year of 1985 by David J. Lipman and William Pearson and this particular software, uh, for this particular software, the input file which they had developed was very simple. It consisted of just two lines. The first line was a description line, which gave a very quick or a brief description about what the sequence is. And the second line is the sequence itself. Since this input format was very simple, in the later days, it got adapted as the standard format to store the sequence information of either DNA, RNA or protein sequences. So let us take a detailed look into how a FASTA file would look like. 
So like we had discussed earlier, a FASTA file is a text-based format which could consist or which could represent a nucleotide sequence or a protein sequence. And if it is a pro nucleotide FASTA, it will consist of nucleotides such as A, T, G and C. We have an example of a nucleotide FASTA here. So this is the this is how a FASTA file will look like. And since it is a nucleotide FASTA, we, we are able to see continuous arrangement of multiple A, T, G and Cs here. Whereas when we look at a protein FASTA, like I had stated before, it does not contain A, T, G and C, whereas it will contain amino acid, one letter code of amino acids. For example, V stands for valine, a stands for aniline and similarly for every amino acid we have a one letter code and this is how a protein FASTA would look like. So here we could we could see multiple other alphabets other than A, T, G and C. So this is how a protein FASTA would look like. Now talking about what exactly a FASTA file contains or how are we going to interpret a FASTA file, we will talk about the components of a FASTA file. So every FASTA file consists of two major components. The first one is the definition line or a sequence identifier line. So this basic this is basically the first line which describes about the sequence, which gives us information about what that particular sequence is. And the second line is the nucleotide or a protein sequence. So let us consider this example. So the line which is bolded here is the first line that is the sequence identifier line and in the second line we have multiple lines of sequences. So here it is the sequence identifier line and it all, always a sequence identifier line starts with an angular symbol which we call the caret symbol and this sequence identifier line as I was telling before it gives us a description of what exactly the sequence is about. So in this example, we could see that there, there it is written in the first line, it is written x81322.1 E. coli HPCC gene. So this basically says us that says as that the sequence, which is the GAA, GT, and so on, this particular sequence is the sequence of E. coli's HPCC gene. So this is the sequence, nucleotide sequence of this particular gene in the E. coli. And this X81322.1 is the gene identifier, the gene ID. So these are the two major components of a FASTA file. The first line always gives us a description of what the sequence is all about. Now, now let us look at this example, the H5N1. And in this example, we are able to see A, T, G and C and along with that, we are also able to see some new alphabets which is this R and we here we see an N and now there is a confusion. So we were always talking that there are four major nucleotides A, T, G and C. And now we in the, in the FASTA file, we are seeing some new alphabets. So does this mean there are more nucleotides? The answer is no. Even now, there are four basic nucleotides, which is A, T, G, and C. And these new alphabets like R and N are termed as degenerate bases. Let's see what are these degenerate bases, why are we getting them, and how are they getting generated? So now let us let us go back to the, the process of sequencing which we had discussed a few minutes back and in that process we were telling that based on whichever complementary base which gets added to the template sequence we will be getting a light which is recorded based on the uh, base which is getting added. In some cases there can be some records which is not specific to either A, T, G or C. So in some cases, the color does not match to either of the four bases, that is A, T, G and C. In such cases are usually caused because the nucleotide could not be accurately identified. In some cases, uh, the nucleotide at that particular position could not be accurately identified by the sequencer and hence, the, then hence it leads to the generation of these degenerate bases. And in this table, we, we are able to see some alphabets and what are their meaning. Suppose if we have an A, it means there is an adenine. So the meaning is A. If we have a C, it can be a C. For G, it can be a G. And if we have a T or U, it means a thymine because 
it uh, in the rna instead of thymin we have uracil and and from here we have all the new alphabets this can include m r w s y so if we have if we see m in our fasta file this means that at that particular position it can either be a a or it can be a c similarly if we have a y it can either be a c or a t and finally if we see the n alphabet it can mean that it can be any of the four bases it can be either a, a t c or a g at that particular position so this is the this is the reason why we get a degenerate base in our fasta file and how are we going to interpret those particular degenerate bases and now let us quickly look at the file extensions and examples of fasta file so usually a fasta file has an extension of .fa or .fasta so this is a general fasta file and uh, for if we look at an example of a human fasta file this is how it would look like human hg38.fa so if we see if you see a file which has a .fa extension it means that that file is a fasta file and similarly based on what kind of fasta file the extens extension can sometime vary so for example if the fasta file contains the nucleotide information it can sometimes be written as .fna similarly if it has an amino acid sequence that is a protein fasta it can be uh, given the extension .faa uh, which implies it has a amino acid information similarly if it has for a particular gene only for one particular gene out of the whole genome it it can be given as dot ffn and if it contains some non coding rna regions the extension varies based on that it becomes dot frn so on the whole this is all about how a fasta file was initially identified how it originated and what kind of information it stores and what it what how are we going to interpret the information and finally how is the file stored what are the different types of file extensions a fasta file can have now with this we are coming to the next type of file format which we are going to discuss in this lecture so with this we are going to look into the second most important file format which we will be using in bioinformatics so in a fasta file we saw that we will be able to store the complete sequence information and along with that we can also add a description line which mean which uh, gives us an idea of what that particular sequence is all about but is it possible to know the quality of that sequence yes so a fast queue file format makes it possible to know the quality of the sequence also so what exactly is this fast queue file a fast queue file is basically a fasta file plus some quality scores so this is the example of how a fast queue file will look like it basically has four lines and now let us talk about what exactly is a fast queue file so a fast queue file is also used to store biological information biological sequence information but along with their quality scores and each fast queue file is required to have four lines if we see this example here there are four major lines the first line is the sequence identifier line which we already saw in a fasta file also the second line is the sequence similar to a fasta file but here we have two more extra lines the third line is again a sequence identifier line that is like the first line there is again a third line and the fourth line is the quality score for each of the sequence which is shown in line 2 a quality score is given in line 4 so let us look about this quality score what exactly are these quality scores and why do we want to know these quality scores in detail so what are this quality scores and what exactly is this quality scoring so quality scores just gives us an idea about the probability that a base at that particular position is called incorrectly let us say in position 1 we are getting a so how sure is it at that particular position it is really a a or is it some other base so based on the quality score we will get to know if that particular base is called correctly or incorrectly if we have a higher quality score then the base is correct and if we have a lower quality scores then the base can then that particular nucleotide can be potentially wrong so how are we going to calculate this scores we need to get familiarized with two terms 
one is q which is the quality score and the other one is e which is the estimated probability of the base call being wrong so how are we going to calculate the score now so let us calculate we are just going to take a negative logarithm 10 of the of the e value which is the estimated probability of the base call being wrong so so let us consider this example here in the first column we have a list of quality scores like q10 q20 and q30 in the second column we have the e value which is the probability of an incorrect base and in the third column we have the interpretation of accuracy so if we consider the quality score of 10 which is q10 it means that the probability of an incorrect base is 1 in 10 Therefore, the overall accuracy becomes 90%. Whereas if we see Q20, the probability of an incorrect base is 1 in 100. Therefore, the accuracy becomes 99%. And similarly, if we see the quality score of Q30, this means that the probability of an incorrect base call is 1 in 1000 bases. And therefore, the accuracy becomes even more higher. That is 99.9%. .9%. So from this, we get to know that Q30 means a very high accuracy and if the quality score increases more than 30, this means that the accuracy also gets increased at that rate. So and here, now that we know the, quali that the quality score increases, the accuracy also gets increased, there is a scoring system which uses non-numerics like it uses symbols, it uses alphabets, which is which is associated with each of the Q score. If we see the tables here, suppose if the quality score is zero, the symbol associated with it is an exclamation symbol. And if suppose the quality score is five, we have the Amberson symbol. And if we have the quality, if we have a quality score of 15, the symbol is zero. And if we have a quality score of 31, we have add the rate symbol. And if we have a quality score of 40, we have the I alphabet. So for each of the quality score, either a symbol or a number or an alphabet is, is associated to it. So using this, we can uh, now look into the FASTQ file format. Now, when we look at the components of a FASTQ, the first thing is the header or the sequence identifier, which is line number one and line number three. And the next is the sequence and its quality score, which is shown in line number two and line number four. So for each of the base, which is shown in line number two, we have the associated quality score symbol. Now let us do a quick exercise. This is the example FASTQ file. And let us check the quality of each base, which we see in this sequence. So I have given the line 2 and line 4 separately here. So for G, we have an I and for T, we have an I. And lastly, last, if we see, if we see the C, we have a 9. And if for this A, we have a 9. For the C, we have a G. So for each base, we have a quality symbol here. When we go, go back to that table and look at the each of the symbol, the meaning for each or the score for each of the symbol, we see that I stands for Q40, 9 stands for Q24, G stands for Q38 and C stands for Q34. So overall we see that all the bases here are of good quality. So this is how a fast Q file provides both the sequence along with its quality score. Now coming to the end of this lecture, let us take a very quick recap of what we did in this exercise. So first we talked about a FASTQ file which has two major sections. One is the header section or the sequence identifier line and it is followed by a sequence. And usually the fast, FASTA files are stored with the file extension .fa or .fasta. And in the next part we saw about the FASTQ file which has three major components. One is the header or the sequence identifier. Next is the sequence. And the last is the quality score, which is associated or corresponding to that sequence. And generally, the FASTQ files are stored with the file extension FQ or .fastq. So with this, we come to an end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we covered two major file formats, which are very useful in bioinformatics. What are their components? 
how do they look like and what do we interpret from them so with this this lecture comes to an end thank you